So you're going to make a ride at Utah Springs on that. Right, right, right. We're coming right at the water. The building that we're facing, the building that we're facing, Nicka, right here, mm -hmm. um, was the old Western High School. That's right. And it was there for a number of years, and of course right until the 60s. Right, right there, my mother went there. Yes. <laughs> it's now <laughs> condominiums. <laughs> yes. What a rocket. How many of you remember Jerry Turner, who was a reporter? Yeah. Well, Jerry Turner stayed there until he became so ill just before he died. Aww. That's where he lived. Make a right here on Franklin Street. Yes, in the old Greyhound bus station. Yes. yes. We just passed the former Greyhound bus station, which was there for a long time. What is the name? Um, it's uh, one of the state centers for training. We're going to make a right on Franklin Street and then we'll come to Packer Street. And we're going to, as I started to say, um, St. Mary's Center, which was a formal, former um, St. Mary's Seminary, which was there until 1969. And it moved up to in Roland Park to Roland Avenue, which is St. Mary's Seminary now there. But it was the first Catholic seminary in our nation. I'm sure you've heard of names like Mother uh, Seton, mm -hmm. Saint Seton, mm -hmm. and um, she was the first American saint. Um, we want to also remember that you'll get to meet Mother Mary Elizabeth Lang, who uh, being, uh, an effort is being made to make her into a saint. Mm -hmm. um, she started the first black sect of nuns. Oblate uh, the Oblate Sisters of Providence. Mm -hmm. She founded the um, St. Francis Academy. Academy. Mm -hmm. She was first on this side of town, on George Street. Mm -hmm. And then in 1828, moved to Chase, Chase Street. Street. Mm -hmm. And so it's still there. You can go on a tour to that school and you'll be able to see the room in which she stayed and, and where she died. And that is very significant with all the work she tried to do. She came from Haiti That's right. and came here and found that especially black children couldn't read or write. So she started a school in her little house over here on George Street. You're going to make a left into the parking lot. Oh, oh okay. You can. It's right here. So you're going to make a left. Sure. Sister of Providence, and I welcome you to St. Mary's Seminary and the beautiful Chapelle Bas, the lower chapel where women and colors had to worship 
we were not allowed upstairs in the upper chapel. I'm here to tell you about the Order of Nuns that I founded along with Father Hector Joubert, Sulpician priest, right here in beautiful Baltimore, Maryland. So let me share with you right now some of my past and how the Oblate Sisters of Providence came into being. The providence of God is not anything I desired that brought me to Baltimore, Maryland, to the area that we call Fells Point. And I saw little colored children who were so hungry and so poor, they could not read nor write. And together with my friend Magdalene Balas, we opened a school for colored children. But the money my father had left me after he died. In our own home, one night we were talking and we found out that we both had a desire to be true religious women of God. <laughs> but in the early 1800s, there were no orders of Catholic women of God that would accept our kind. We wanted so badly, but we did not know where to start. Now in France, there was a young man, James Hector Joubert, the son of a wealthy lawyer who had been sent off to military school. His father wanted him to be a general, to be a military man. Well, God had another plan for James Hector Joubert because he too was drawn to Baltimore. He heard the call and became a Salvation priest. And he was sent to St. Mary's Seminary to train the young seminarians. But he too had a desire to teach the colored children their catechism, their Catholic doctrine. He wanted to teach them about Jesus. This was very odd desire of his because you must remember this is the pre-Civil War, and in Rome, there were some who argued that colors and Africans had no souls. So we weren't worth salvation. And teaching us about God was just a waste of time. But Father Joubert had a burning in his heart for all souls. He had heard that there were two colored women who were teaching the French refugee children their reading and writing and math in the home. So he came to us one night and asked us, would we work with him to teach the colored French-speaking refugee children their catechism? Oh, we just knew that we heard the call of God. And we told him that night of our desire to become true religious, to become vowed religious women of God. And he accepted our plea. We prayed that night, all four of us by now, because we had been joined by Rosa and Bo, another French-speaking refugee. And we prayed all night long. And when we finished praying, Father Joubert helped us to develop our womb and to get our papers together. He first went to Bishop Tessier, who turned us down flat. Mm -hmm. But then, as God would have it, a new bishop came to Baltimore, Bishop Whitfield. And when Father Joubert presented our plans to start the Oblate Sisters to him, he said, I see the finger of God in what you are proposing. Go, press on, and don't let anyone stop you. You have my blessing. The finger of God, can you imagine that? It was as God had touched me right on my shoulder and said, I have answered your prayers. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, what joy did fill my soul. Something happened. And now I know he touched me and made me beautiful. By this time we had a fourth. Teresa Bunches, who had been one of our students, she was
was younger than the rest of us, but she was full of so much energy and she wanted to become one of our sisters. We opened the St. Francis School for Colored Girls and in July 1828, we started making our vows. We finished our year of novitiate training under the guidance of Father Joubert. And after that year was over, on July the 2nd, 1829, we took our final vows as the Oblate Sisters of Providence. Why did we choose that name? Oblate. Our oblation, our gift to God. We were turning ourselves and our whole lives over to God to use as He pleased. Sisters, well, that's self explanatory. Providence, we knew how hard it was going to be. But we relied on the total providence of God, as He says in His scriptures, to furnish all our needs according to His riches in Christ Jesus. Our motto became Providencia from the day God will provide. And we began to flourish as the obvious sisters. All we took in new sisters, French-speaking sisters mostly, it was a $400 dowry that you had to pay to become an Oblate sister. Many of the women who wanted to come in were still enslaved. So Father Joubert helped to purchase their freedom, to get their manumission so they could become Oblate sisters. Things were happening for us. 1832, there was the Baltimore cholera epidemic. And although the Sisters of Charity were a nursing order, when they were asked to help, they sent only four of their sisters. And no one wanted to minister to the poor colored community in Baltimore. By then there were 11 of us, and all 11 sisters volunteered to help. We were supposed to be a teaching order, but we knew that God's people and our people needed us. And what we did to formulate the Oblate Sisters of Providence was both heroic and historic because the prevailing notion of a colored woman in a southern antebellum state was that we were only good for two things. We were either women of low virtue for the use of men, both black and white, or we were mammies, fit only to raise other people's children. But the Oblate Sisters of Providence proved them wrong, for we were the women of highest virtue. And we were here to teach our own children. I was strict. Many of the sisters did not like me, but I knew that I could not let there be any hint of scandal because that was just what the Catholic Church was looking for to close our doors. The political climate was also very, very strange. There were people called the know-nothings. And in Baltimore, they hated anything Catholic. Irish immigrants, German immigrants. It's hard for a young woman to go against the tide when the rest of us were so much older. She tried everything, but it looked like the doors of the Oblate Sisters of Providence were about to close. Now, Sister Teresa Duchemin was colored by virtue of her great-grandfather. She was very light, could pass for white, had blonde hair and blue eyes. So when a young Redemptive priest, Father Gillet, came to our convent and gave us rousing sermons in French, he went back to Monroe, Michigan, and he decided he wanted to start an order of nuns in this frontier town, this wilderness. And Sister Teresa left the Oblate Sisters of Providence to start her own order. When she got to Monroe, Michigan, 
she realized that the settlement was all white. So rather than reveal that one tenth of one percent that made her color, she passed for white. And she started the school systems of the Emanuel Garden. Then another one of her sisters went and joined Sister Teresa. She started the sister service excuse me, of the Emanuel Garden. When a third of our sisters wrote to Mother Teresa and asked if she could join, she wrote her back and told her, do not come. We will not be welcome because you are too dark of color. Because that would bring out the secret. I don't blame Sister Teresa. She was like a daughter to me. I had taught her in our school. She feared so much that the doors of the Avalade sisters would be closed and she would not fulfill her destiny to be a true religious. She took the first chance she got. And she paid dearly for it. She was so energetic, even in Rome, Michigan. She had so many sisters coming in. She decided to move her sisters to Detroit, Michigan. And she wanted to open another mother house there. The bishop told her no, she couldn't do it, she did it anyway. So what he did was, he revealed to everyone that she was colored. Mm -hmm. He had her name stricken from the records of her beloved sisters. And she was banished from the order that she stopped. Mm -hmm. And was sent to live with the gray nuns in Canada. She only returned after her old age so she could die in the convent and be buried. But the Avalon sisters, her doors didn't close. I often wonder what would have happened if Teresa had stayed because she should have relied on the providence of God as we did. Because we got to know that fact. A redemptive priest, Father Fanny's and Wanda, we call him our second founder. He went to the bishop and he was not afraid to get on his knees and beg to be our religious advisor. And he began to flourish together. The doors of St. Francis School for Colored Girls, you may know as St. Francis Academy, have not been closed in almost 180 years. Our mother house is in Catonville on Gun Road. And believe it or not, once we built that mother house and we were about to move in, it burned to the ground. You see, Satan is busy if you are doing the right thing. So we knew we must have been doing what God wanted us to do. We needed the money to build sold aprons, chicken dinners, scrub people's floors. Yes, a good help is hard to find, but if you're doing it for the right reason, it doesn't bother you at all. We had a benefactor who had written us in his will, and when he passed away, the amount we needed to rebuild was exactly what we had. And the mother house on Gun Road. I ask you to please keep the Avalid Sisters of Providence in your prayers. For we are an aging community with low numbers, but we are still here. And we still believe that Providencia, Providay, Providence will provide and God will continue to come. All to Jesus. I surrender only as be our Worldly treasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. Je abandon tout, je abandon tout. Tu à toi, mon redempteur béni.
Jesus and Mary now and forever. Study on the bones, there was no white blood 
the Mother Mary Lodge. Her ancestor, ancestor is West Africa. How they got to Cuba, speaking French, smoke, we will never know. <laughs> but like I said, the transatlantic slave trade took people of color all over the world. So they might have been in France. And Mother Line used to say two of her things. I so wishes to be the will of God, which is my favorite quote of hers. And she would say to people, she was French to her bone. So she didn't say Cuba, she didn't say Haitian, she was French to her bone. So they may have come from France, or they may have been descendants of some people who came from France to either escape slavery or just migrate. So I can't speak to um, the Sharon Heck that worked with Sister Reginald and they are the historians. And I've talked with Sharon at length because for a long time they thought Mama Line had come from Haiti. That's in all the books and on the internet that she's mulatto and she was a slave. She was never a slave. She's not mulatto and she didn't come from here. <laughs> all of those things are, you know, have been updated. Um, I think they just assume black, French speaking, Caribbean got to be here. Somewhere along the line. But the older records always said Santiago, Cuba. Somewhere somebody said Haiti, it caught on and it just, you know, but Go. Yeah, we got to spit up. That's right, you're on the time frame. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please look around this beautiful chapel. Notice the beautifully painted stations of the cross. If you are not Catholic, let me explain that these pictures depict the Via de la Rosa, the walk that Jesus made to the cross and the different stops along the way. During Fridays, during Lent, we stop and pray and remember what our Savior went through for our salvation. The statues that you see around depict the women of Baltimore who made their religious walk and worship right here in this chapel. There you see Mother Seton Mother Mary Lyons, a likeness of myself. And in the back as you leave, you'll notice Sister Teresa Duchemin, former superior of the Oblate Sisters of Providence and the foundress of the Sister Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Please enjoy your stay, enjoy your tour. God bless you and keep the Oblate Sisters of Providence in your prayers.